population. Okay, that would rep that could represent more than one quantum state if you have partially filled subshells, right? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. If you have partially filled subshells, an electron configuration could be could have a de will have a degeneracy that's more than one. There's more than one quantum state associated with that. Uh, electron configuration and we said that if we were to try to fully account for electron and electron repulsion okay then it turns out that uh, the the degeneracy associated with your electron configuration will be lifted right so we said that for each electron configuration we can write for each possible microstate of an electron configuration, we can write a Slater determinant. And if you apply perturbation theory to get a better uh, accuracy, better a better way to account for electron-electron repulsion, then you take linear combinations of these Slater determinants, and that will give you terms. And we said that a term, a set of these microstates that have the same L and J, okay. I mean, L and S, I'm sorry, would correspond to a term. Okay? So, for example, when we have a term that says something like doublet P, okay, what does the P stand for? Quantum number L being equal to 1, and the 2 here, the multiplicity, that's the value of. To s plus 1, that means s is equal to 1 half in this case. So what we're saying is that the total orbital angular momentum of your, electro of your electrons would be square root of L times L plus 1 h bar, right? And the total spin angular momentum of your electrons for this particular term would be square root of s times s plus 1 h bar. Okay, and the degeneracy of this term would be 2L plus 1 <coughs> times 2S plus 1, right? So 2S plus 1 is 2, and 2L plus 1 is 3, that would be 6. So a doublet P term would be a term that is comprised of 6 quantum states, right? Now, uh, that is... Up to that point, we have been ignoring spin-orbit interaction. And we talked about spin-orbit interaction earlier when we talked about hydrogenic at ions and the hydrogen atom. So we need to, to get a better accuracy as far as uh, to get a better accuracy as far as trying to match experimental data, we have to take into account spin-orbit interaction for uh, atoms with more than one electron as well. Okay, so let's let's review what spin orbit interaction was. You said that because of the orbital motion of your electron around the nucleus. Okay, so you have, you're you're an elect imagine you're sitting on an electron and you're moving around the nucleus. It would appear as though the nucleus is moving around you, just like we here on Earth as we're going around the sun. It would appear as the sun is going around us. So as far as an observer at the ele uh, at the electron there appears to be a charged particle, the nucleus, that's going around it. Okay, so that charged particle generates a magnetic moment. And so that magnetic moment will interact with, your ele with the electron's intrinsic magnetic moment. Okay, so that leads to an additional potential energy term that you have to add to your Hamiltonian. So we can treat that as a perturbation. And that additional potential energy term is directly proportional to the dot product of the spin angular momentum vector and the total orbital <laughs> angular momentum vector. Okay? So that's why we refer to this correction to our Hamiltonian as, as being due to spin orbit interaction. Now, it's directly proportional to that dot product. The proportionality constant depends on the charge of the nucleus. So the greater the charge of the nucleus, the more we cannot ignore spin-orbit interaction. Okay, this tends to be small for hydrogen, helium, but as you get to, uh, as you get to large atoms that have more protons in the nucleus, 
the spin orbit interaction is something that you can no longer ignore. Okay. So uh, the first order perturbation correction term, if you apply perturbation theory, will be given by this expression right here. It's H C times some constant A times J times J plus one minus L times L plus 1 minus S times S plus 1 times, this is just H bar squared, okay, H over 2 pi squared. All right. Now this A right here is your proportionality constant, and like I said, that depends on uh, the charge of the nucleus. So that, de that depends on the strength of the spin orbit interaction. This L right here, we already know what that L is. For a doublet P, what is L? For example, L would be, uh, L is 1. And your S, what's our S for a doublet P? It's going to be 1 half. Right? 2S plus 1 is 2. Now, J here is the total, the quantum number for the total angular momentum. So it's J, your total angular momentum is just the sum of your orbital angular momentum and your spin angular momentum. Okay, and so as a consequence of that, okay, we can take linear combinations of wave functions associated with a given term to get what we call levels. The actual, so these energy levels will depend on J. Okay, so for a given L and S, you're going to all quantum states that have the same L and S from a given configuration will belong to the same term. Okay, but all of the but these quantum states in a given term they're not going to actually have the same energy if we take into account spin orbit interaction. The actual energy would depend on the quantum number j. So this will this allows us to further split the degeneracy into what we call levels. So a given j level a given j will be associated with an energy level for an atom. Okay. So linear combinations in the same level will have the same J. So we can modify our term symbol by symbol by attaching a J as a subscript next to the term symbol. So for a triplet P, for example, a particular level might be something like triplet P2. So this 2 right here, the number down here, that's your J level. Okay, so if I have a triplet P2, let's just clarify this. This comes from a triplet P term. What is our L? L is 1, and 2S plus 1 is 3. It's a triplet, so therefore S is equal to 1. Okay? So if it's a triplet P2, this is a particular quantum state that has J equals 2. All right? So how do you determine your levels? Let's look at it for a triplet P. Uh, let's look at the doublet P here. That's just the example that was, it's given here. So let's say you have a doublet P term. What's our L for this one again? 1 and our S is 1 half. So what are our possible M sub L's and M sub S? L can be, M sub L can be 1, 0, or negative 1. And what are our possible M sub S? positive one-half and negative one-half. So what do you get? M sub L plus M sub S would give you M sub J, right? The Z components of your <coughs> angular momentum vectors will just add up. So the possible components of your angular momentum vector along the Z axis would have would be M sub J H bar. Okay, and what are the possible M sub J's we can have? What is 1 plus 1 half? 1.5, that's 3 halves, right? What is 0 plus 1 half? That's 1 half. Negative 1 plus 1 half? Negative 1 half. 1 half, 1 plus negative 1 half is positive 1 half. 0 plus negative 1 half? negative one half negative one half plus negative one half is negative three halves. okay 
since, since your m sub j is go from j all the way to negative j, we look at the largest possible m sub j that we have here, which is 3 halves. So that must be part of a set that goes from 3 halves to negative 1 half. So you have 3 halves, I mean 3 halves to negative 3 halves. So from 3 halves to negative 3 halves. So what's 3 halves minus 1? One half and one half minus one is negative one half. So this corresponds to j equals three halves. So that takes care of those four of those: three halves, one half, negative one half, negative three halves. Of the remaining m sub j's, what do you have? One half and negative one half. So that must be part of a set that goes from. 1 half to negative 1 half. So that means of the remaining m sub j, which is 1 half, negative, that must be, you have a set that goes from 1 half to negative 1 half. That must correspond to j equals 1 half. Okay? So for a doublet p, okay, if you apply a correction because of spin orbit interaction, a doublet p term is going to split into two levels. Okay, a doublet P one half and a doublet P three halves level. What's the degeneracy of the doublet P one half level? Two. It's two possible m sub j's. J, m sub j equals plus one half and m sub j equals negative one half. What's the degeneracy of the doublet P three halves level? Four. One, two, three, four that would correspond to m sub j of 3 halves, 1 half, negative 1 half, and negative 3 halves. Right? So that's how you uh, determine the levels. Now the quick way is just to use the, use the Klebs-Gordon formula. Okay? All you have to do is allow j's would just be l plus s all the way down to absolute value of l minus s. Let's apply, let's do that. j equals, what's l? 1 plus 1 half <coughs> all the way down to 1 minus 1 half, l minus s. So what are possible j's? So that's going to be 3 halves all the way down to absolute value of 1 minus 1 half is 1 half, right? So our possible j's are just 3 halves and 1 half. So same thing, okay? So this is the shortcut for what we just did earlier. So the degeneracy of each level is 2j plus 1. You're going from m sub j equals j to negative j. Okay. Let's try another example. Let's try triplet P. What if you have, uh, let's, let's do a triplet D. What would happen if you have a triplet D term? What's our L? L equals 2. Okay. L equals 0 for an S term. It's 1 for a P term. It's 2 for a D term. It's 3 for an F term. Right? So L equals 2. What is our 2S plus 1 here? What's our multiplicity? 3. So that means what is our S? Our S is 1. Okay? So what, what levels can we get for a triplet D term? L plus S all the way down to absolute value of L minus S. So those are the possible J values. So that's going to be 2 plus 1 all the way down to absolute value of 2 minus 1. And so that gives us 3 all the way down to what's absolute value of 2 minus 1? 1. So 3, 2, and 1. So a triplet D term once you apply spin orbit interaction correction breaks up into three levels what are those three levels triplet d2 triplet uh, triplet d3 triplet 
Okay, you got a triplet D3, triplet D2, and triplet D1. Okay, so that's how, that's how you get your levels from a term. Okay, here's one experimental evidence of spin orbit interaction. Uh, if you look at the spectral lines for sodium, that yellow light, bright yellow light of sodium that you see at around 589 nanometers, if you look at it at very high resolution, you'll find that that actually has two very closely spaced lines. And the wave numbers for those lines are separated by only 17 reciprocal centimeters. Okay? So this, uh, that is response, the, that, Transition is a transition from, okay, uh, sodium as electron configuration of sodium. You've got a neon core, the S1, that's your ground state, right? So the ground state of sodium is a doublet S term. Okay, why is it a doublet? Okay, you have one electron, okay, in a partially filled orbital, one partially filled orbital with one electron, so that's a doublet. So it's either spin up or spin down. What is our L here? Big L is just our little L. It's going to be zero. So that's why you have a doublet S. That's your ground state. Now, the yellow line involves a transition from a 3P orbital to a 3S orbital. So in an excited sodium atom, you have a neon core, and your electron is in the 3P orbital. So what's the first excited term for sodium then? Again, you have one unpaired electron in a partially in one partially filled orbital, so that's going to be a doublet, right? So it's a doublet, and what's our L here? The big L is equal to little l, which is equal to one, so that's a p term. So your first excited state is a doublet p term. Okay, so you don't have doublet p three halves and doublet p one half. We derived that earlier, right? If you have a doublet p term possible J's are three halves and one half, okay? So the doublet P term is actually not singly degenerate. It's actually two levels, a doublet P one half term and a doublet P, uh, doublet P one half level and a doublet P three halves level. So what you see there are two lines, two spectral lines in the emission spectrum of sodium. That's known as a sodium D line. So where do we look at these uh, atomic energy levels? You can look it up from uh, Atomic Spectral Database from the NIST, this website right here. Okay, and so let's take a look at that. Uh, Web.nist.gov. Web what was it? You just do a search for atomic. Just Google uh, Atomic Spectral Database NIST, okay. and you'll find it there. And once you get to that website, you can just select levels here if you want to see what the allowed energy levels are. We did this in the lab already when we did the Atomic Spectral Lab. Right? Uh, but that one, we were searching for lines. If you know the lines, then you, if you have the experimental lines, you can search for the atomic energy levels responsible for it. Right? So let's just look at the atomic levels. Uh, if you're interested, for example, in the atomic levels for sodium, you just type Na and then the Roman numeral 1 for the atom, Roman numeral 2 for the singly ionized, like Na+, plus, you put Roman numeral 2, Na2. So we're going to put Na for sodium, Roman numeral 1. And you can specify whether you want your units in reciprocal centimeters or electron volts. Let's say I want it in electron volts. And then you can retrieve your data here. Click on this button. And th these are your these are your uh, energy levels for your sodium. So the ground state of sodium Electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. It just gives you the last part of it. And then 3s1. You'll notice it's a doublet s. Okay. And a lot of possible j values for doublet s would be j1 half. And that's the ground state. So by convention on, the, on this website, 
the lowest energy is always assigned as zero. Okay? And you have doublet P one half and doublet P three halves. That's 2.1 electron volts, 2.102 electron volts for the doublet P one half, and the energy of the doublet P three halves is 2.104 electron volts. Okay? And then if you have a 2P6 4S1 configuration, again you have another doublet S, and uh, that's your first, ex okay, so this is your second, third excited state. So your first excited state is doublet P1 half, the next one is doublet P3 halves, okay? And your third excited state would be with the electron in the 4S orbital, it's a doublet S1 half, and it's 3.1913529 electron volts. So that's what you need to do to look up uh, energy levels. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that not means. Uh, there's probably a sub, uh, there should be some uh, explanation for that somewhere in the website. Okay. So let's see, what if we were to do carbon? Carbon, Roman numeral one, right? Retrieve data. And here's the ground state of carbon. What did we say the ground state of carbon was? We talked about the ground term last time. We talked about deriving it from uh, the, the 2P2 configuration. You have partially filled 2P orbital, 2P subshell with two electrons. Remember, you get your 2P2 configuration. It gives you three terms, a singlet D, singlet S, and a triplet P. Notice your triplet P is your ground state, okay? And triplet P0 is the ground level, triplet P1, and then you have triplet P2 are your first and second excited state, okay? And then, so... Remember Hund's rule, maximum multiplicity. Among the terms that you can get from the ground configuration, the terms. <coughs> All right, so one thing you'll find when we did carbon was that uh, the term with the highest multiplicity is the one with the lower energy, right? One thing you'll also notice is if you have a level, Triplet P0 had the lowest energy, so triplet P0 is lower in energy than triplet P1, which is lower energy than triplet P2. That's generally true if your if your partially filled subshell is less than half filled. Okay? If it's more than half filled, it's at, the order is actually reversed. In other words, the A here, remember the A, the, the proportionality constant in your spin orbit interaction. That's a positive number. If it's more than half filled, your A is going to be a negative number. The order is going to be reversed. The higher J, the highest J, okay, will have the lowest energy. Got it reversed. Okay. We'll have the lowest energy. So for example, oxygen. Let's do a search for oxygen. What's the ground state of oxygen? Let's see if we can. What's the electron configuration for oxygen? 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, right? 2p4 is just like 2p2. Why? Because you have 1, 2, 3, 4, right? It's like you have, what, what do you expect the ground state to be? Two un maximum number of unpaired electrons you can have is 2. So if you have two unpaired electrons, what's what's the highest multiplicity? No, maximum number of unpaired electrons plus one would give you the highest multiplicity. It's a triplet. It's just like you have two, in the case of carbon, you have two P2. Your ground state is a triplet. Okay? In fact, a P2 and a P4 will give you the same terms. Why is that? How many... Uh, microstates do you have with a P2 term? You remember you have 6 factorial divided by 2 factorial, four mi 6 minus 2 factorial, right? Okay. 
So that's 6 factorial over 2 factorial, 4 factorial, which is 15. Okay. What if it's P4? Then it's going to be 6 factorial over 4 factorial, 2 factorial, the same thing, 15. Think about P4 as having two holes rather than two electrons. And so those, there's going to be 15 different ways of, distrib of distributing those two holes instead of 15 different ways of distributing two electrons. So there's really the same, the same it's, it gives you the same terms, okay? So it's, it, will all, it will still give you a triplet P, a singlet D, and a singlet S, just like carbon. So let's look up the terms for uh, oxygen. And what do you find? Okay, look at the case of oxygen. Triplet P is still the ground state, largest multiplicity, but look at the ground level. It's triplet P2. So triplet P2 has the lowest energy, followed by triplet P1 and then triplet P0. So the order is reversed for oxygen compared to carbon. They both have triplet P, and then you have singlet D and singlet S. You'll notice just like carbon, okay? But the order has switched for the J levels. So the highest J will have the lowest energy within a term if the valence subshell is more than half shell. Okay. Now. The preceding slides that we've been, what we've been talking about so far, are applicable when your spin orbit interaction is weak. Okay, so the method that we're using, we were using to determine the levels, is known as Russell Saunders or LS coupling scheme. Okay, but like I said, when spin orbit coupling becomes very strong, the spin orbit interaction becomes very strong. Your correction to the spin or due to spin orbit interaction will become much larger than the actual correction you would need to fully account for electron electron repulsion. So it's better to do the spin orbit correction first before you apply the electron electron repulsion correction. Right? And so uh, in these cases, you use a different uh, scheme for coming up with the uh, with the energy level. <coughs> All right, so in this case, you apply the spin orbit correction first to get the terms. You specify the term by listing the J for each electron. Okay, so the J, a possible J's for each electron would be L plus S all the way to L minus S. So you specify a term there by spe then by specifying J1, J1, J2, let's say you have two electrons, you spe spe instead of specifying big L and big S for the term, your term will be J1 and J2, okay? And then once you find, apply the correction to fully account for electron-electron repulsion, then the terms, okay, that have the same J will have the same energy. So your J's would now be J1 plus J2 all the way down to J1 minus J2 if you have two electrons in your, in your electron configuration. Okay, so let's look at xenon, for example. Uh, let's see, atomic spectral database. That, we expect that to have a very large spin orbit uh, interaction term. Xenon one. Okay. Look at the um, term that's given there. That's three halves, okay? But you have a singlet S. Uh, why is the why is the JJ? By the way, that coupling scheme that we talked about is known as a JJ coupling scheme instead of an LS or Russell Saunders coupling scheme. 
Why, but why is the Russell Sunrise scheme applicable to this ground state, singlet S? What happens if you have an S state? Do you have spin orbit interaction? No. There, there is no L, right? So, so, uh, there's, so you, that's why you have that singlet S term. But here you'll, you'll notice that you're, you're specifying the J's in your, uh, in your uh, term symbol. Okay? So that's the JJ coupling scheme. Now, to fully understand atomic spectra, okay, these are the selection rules. Delta S equals zero for so the change in uh, the total spin angular momentum must be zero. Delta L must be zero or plus or minus one. Change in little L must be plus or minus one. We talked about that when we talked about the hydrogen atom. Delta J must be zero or plus or minus one, although J zero to J zero is not an allowed transition. Okay, you can get a summary of all the allowed transitions by generating what's called a Grotrian diagram, and you can do that by going to the spectral database. Okay, so here's a Grotrian diagram for helium. Okay, and you'll notice the you have here. In your Grotrian diagram, you have your term symbols listed, okay? And uh, you have all your singlets here in one, oops, right next to each other. You'll notice you can only have transitions from singlets to singlets, triplets with to triplets, okay? So delta S must be equal to zero. So when you lay out your Grotrian diagram, you put your singlet side by side. That way, you can indicate because you don't you don't expect triplets and singlets to cross. Okay, transitions between singlets and triplets are not allowed. And then delta L must be equal to zero or plus or minus one. What do you notice about this Grotrian diagram? Okay, you can only have transitions between S and P, P and D. Okay, you don't have a D to S transition because that would be a delta L equals two, right? D, remember L is zero for an S term, one for a P term, two for a D term, three for an F term. So you only get transitions in neighboring uh, stacks here, okay? And then of course we talk about delta L, small l, like if you're going from a 2p orb, if you're starting from a 2p orbital, you can only end up one. Either in, a, in an s orbital, like a 3s or a 4s or a 1s, okay? But you cannot go to uh, a 3p, okay? Because that would be delta L equals zero. P to P would not be allowed. And you cannot go to a 3d, because that would be delta L equals two. And right, so if you go, for, if you switch from one electron configuration to another configuration, electron configuration, the L quantum number of the electron that switches uh, cannot change by more than one. Okay, and it must change by at least one L quantum number. All right, and that's. And that's the end of this lecture. Tomorrow we'll uh, talk about a molecular structure.